Hello, I'm Leslie Hoskins and I'm working with the Woodlanders Lives and Landscapes project. And what we're doing is we're looking at what it was like to work in the rural industries in the Chilterns in the 19th century and the earlier part of the 20th century. And one of those rural industries was straw plaiting, which is the process of braiding together straws into decorative strips, which were then could be sewn together and made into hats. The hat making itself was done in Luton and Dunstable, but the straw plaiting was often done in the villages. And we were very lucky to find in the British Library a recording that was made in 1957 of a Mrs Nellie Keane, who had been a straw platter. She was actually interviewed uh, by Stanley Ellis of Leeds University as part of a big project to record local dialects that were going out of use and Mrs Keane has a pretty strong Bucks accent, as you'll be able to hear in the forthcoming extracts. But what they were talking about, she and Stanley Ellis, largely was straw plaiting, because Nellie herself had been a straw platter in her girlhood. Nellie Davis was born in 1878 in Buckland, near Tring. She married in 1904, a Charles Keane, and she lived in, in Model Row, Buckland, for much of her life. And you can see Model Row in the photograph here, two up, two down, neat little cottages built in 1863. And she died in Buckland and was buried in Buckland Churchyard alongside her husband. Straw hats were big business in the 19th and early 20th century. They were popular, they were fashionable, and they could be functional. And you can see in this photograph of a group of people standing outside their cottages at Lacey Green, not far away, uh, that the little girls, and indeed one of the little boys, are all wearing straw hats. But at a different part of the sort of social scale, this group of hospital workers are on an outing, and the nurses are all wearing straw boaters. So there were a lot of hats being made and a lot of hats being sold. And if we look at the 1881 census for Buckland, uh, we can see that Nellie Davis's mother and grandmother were both straw platters at the time. Nellie Davis herself was a straw platter for a while, and in this extract she talks about the kind of straw plait that she made and some of the te techniques of making it. Ah, but there was different ways, different designs. Ah, different, oh, lots of different kinds of plaiting. Mm. But I always done what they call the pearl plait. Uh, there was brilliant plait, you see, that used to be very, they used to do it over and over, beautiful plait that was, you see, and railroad, but they used to have coloured straws, they used to do other straws for that, you see, a mixture. But I always done the pearl. And uh, then when you'd done this plait, you see, you had to clip it. You see, you'd have to leave so many straws when you put your fresh straws in, because the straws only be used like, be like this, because they used to have them under their arm, the old-fashioned folks, and pull them out of the water, you see. Two together, put them through the maids, you see, to wet them to, to keep on plaiting. And she explained some of the technicalities of, of making the straw. And so you can see in this photograph that a woman is using what's called a mill, which was a little device, like rolling pins, um, stuck to the wall. And you put your straw through there and it flattens it out and makes it smooth and pliable before plaiting. And it can, the plaited straw can go in afterwards as well, uh, after it had been plaited to make it smooth. And this photograph shows a, uh, somebody using a splitter, which is a device a bit like a sort of mini chip making machine, and that you feed a straw through that, a big, a fat, a fat straw, and it comes out as you know, maybe four or six much finer straws to make finer plait. In 1851, there were 136 women and girls in Buckland. That's over the working age, and that was eight at that time. And of those 136, almost two, th no, more than two thirds of them were actually in the straw plaiting business. And Nellie explains how, how they would take their, take their straw plaited straw to Tring on a Friday to the market and sell it there to the dealers and how they get paid. And then tie it all up and take it to Tring Market to sell it. You used to have it on your arm, the old fashioned folks used to, and then the buyers used to come rain. Some give them four pence and a score for it, some five pence and that look, you know. And where did they come from? Luton, mm -hmm. straw and danceable. Mm -hmm. Ate that way, you see. Those were the flat boys those days, because that was a big hat factory place, you know. manufacturing place, Luton, you see. Mm -hmm. Always made all the straw hats there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And who did this planting then? Oh, everybody had to do it had done it years ago, turn a shilling or two. Mm -hmm. The women and children, everybody. Only they got so prayed the latter part of the time, they wouldn't do it, you see. Which a week might that bring in if all the family were doing it? Well, you see, it depends how many done it, you see. 
Well, some would do 10 score, 20 score. Well, if that was only about four, five pence a score, that wasn't much, was it? Mm -hmm. Not after all. And then you got to walk the thing to take it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the boys used to come and, and they, they used to be in old market house at Tring years ago. They pulled it down now. And they used to go under there and the plat boys used to come round. And then, of course, they used to look at the plat. And if the boy that had given Mike more a score or anything like that, he had it, you see. Mm. And they used to pay at the Rose and Crane and they have a little room there, you see. And down at that, uh, further down the town, the Green Man it used to be, they pulled it down there, look, you see, all the different places where they used to pay for it, the boroughs. She explains that at one time, practically everybody did it, even young children. And she talks about the plat schools that young children went to. And you can see a plat school in this illustration at the bottom, which looks rather charming. It's possible that they weren't quite as charming as all that. They were more workshops, really, for small children. All the children, they used to have down the road, uh, like what they call a platting school in the children's holidays. Mm. A woman used to have all the children sit round and they'd go sit with the platting straws. They used to take the straws with them, you see, and do this plat. Mm. And one used to hurry up and see which could do more, one more than the other, you see. Mm. Oh, yes. And who got the money for that? Well, the parents. Ah, but when the children went to the school? Oh, yeah, they paid about three items a week for the woman having you there. Oh. Oh, yes. And who got the plat? She got the plat, did she? Oh, no, you had, to bring, plat you had to bring it back home and your mother take it to market to sell it. But although Nellie had been talking about how important the industry, straw plaiting industry, was in Buckland, by the time of the 1891 census, when she must have been about 13, the situation had changed. There were, at this point, about 156 women and girls in Buckland, but only eight of those were involved in straw plaiting. The local industry had been badly undercut by foreign competition, straw plat coming in from places like Japan, and what had been a thriving rural industry had pretty much disappeared by about 1900. So we're very lucky to have this first-hand account of what it was actually like to be involved in that industry. <laughs>